I want to um, talk quickly tonight just about um, Jesus and what he represented to the world and what he came to do. And if you're familiar with your Bible at all, the Gospels, we have Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They were the, the writers of the four Gospels. And each of them had a different perspective, and they brought their personality at shine through the writings. The one we're going to highlight tonight is John, and I think John, if he wanted to, he could um, apply and for sure had the job of working for Hallmark. He was the poet. If he was to write books, I think when looking through the bookstore, you would find his in the poetry section because he just, he had a way with words. We call that a wordsmith now, but he had a way of taking and putting emotions into his writings. And so I want to highlight John tonight. I'm going to read uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 through 7, and then we're going to go back and we're going to look at exactly what he is trying to convey. Here, uh -huh, one, yeah, 1 through 7. No, 1 through 7, sorry. Can you pull that up? Okay. So let me tell you about John while we're doing this. Um, John, when he was writing, he uh, was writing to a group of non-believers, and he was writing to a group of religious fanatics that were teaching false doctrine. And so what he wants to do is he wants to establish who Jesus was. This is actually a letter that he is writing to fellow believers to churches. And it says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, and we have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to the you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. But if we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Here's a good part, too. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. I love how John describes a relationship with Christ. He says, we walk in the light. Jesus was the light of the world. And what's great about the light is light overcomes darkness. If you go into a dark room and you turn on the light, darkness doesn't win. As long as there is light, it has to scatter. It has to leave. Light overtakes darkness. Darkness never wins. It can never overtake the light. The darkness in the room can't say, no, I'm going to stay here even though you've got the light bulb shining bright. It leaves. So it's the same way with Christ. When he walks with you, darkness has to leave. So the more you hang out in the light, the more darkness is overcome in your life. The more light you have, it begins to chase out the darkness. And the Bible says that that light within you purifies you. What a good story that is. In other words, the darkness that you have in your life, the things, the hidden sins, the more that you walk in the light, the more it's revealed. And when it's revealed, the more it loses its power and it has to flee. It's when we keep things hidden that the light can't overtake it. And Jesus is that light. See, in that light, there's freedom. 
When you open up your heart and not just learn about him, see, knowledge is one thing, experience something else completely different. You can have knowledge of knowing how a cake is made, but until you taste one, that's a whole different experience. You then look at that recipe a little bit different of like, yeah, that's going to taste so good. You can read a menu in the restaurant, and while it may sound okay by the description, there's no real great attachment there until you put it in your mouth and until you experience it. Then all of a sudden, man, there's a, there's a connection that's there. See, we can learn all about God, but until you experience him, you don't really know him. So I want to back up and I want to look at a few of these verses again. And what happens in verse 1 and 2 is John is writing a letter. And in this letter, he is actually addressing a false doctrine that's popular going around at that time. That false doctrine um, is referred to as agnosticism. They were agnostic. And what that means, that means that they believe that a savior, Jesus, could not have been born in flesh and blood. They believed that all humankind had evil in them, and there's no way that something pure and beautiful could have been born um, as a savior. They believed that knowledge was how you gained the spiritualism. Knowledge was what you were to strive for. So the spiritual things, they were good. Physical things, they were bad. So Jesus could not have come and lived in flesh. That would have been bad in their viewpoint. So John says, that which was from the beginning. Now actually, he says beginning because that's where we have a starting point. But here to really warp your brain, God had no beginning. God always was. But to give them a starting point, he says, way back, as far as you can ever imagine or think, at the very beginning, there was God. It says, that which we heard. So he says that which we heard, and they were okay with the hearing part, because in the Old Testament, they heard of prophets that would say, I heard the voice of God. They're okay with that part. But John goes on a little bit further. He doesn't just say we heard him, but we have seen him with our eyes. We've looked at him. We've even touched him, is what he's saying. He says, I have proof, see, because I was an eyewitness to the Savior. I heard him. I had talks with him. I ate with him. I watched him. And I touched him. So he's saying that word that was in the very beginning, it became flesh and it dwelt and lived and walked among us. So he is addressing a false doctrine that's going around saying this couldn't have been true. John is going to show them why Jesus is the Savior and he is the light. He goes on and he's talking in verse 3, and what he says about verse 3 is that this internal God appeared for fellowship. He appeared for fellowship, not condemnation, not to judge, not in wrath. He came for a connection. He came for a relationship. The fact that there's no beginning to God, that's mind-blowing enough, but the idea that this God left heaven in the form of his son just to get to know us, to walk with us, to talk with us. And John's telling them all these other gods that you've heard about that are angry and you have to sacrifice to and you never know if you're good enough. This God, this one, this God of love, he came to have a relationship. And Jesus was our way to that relationship. Jesus, he is the way for us to be able to have a relationship with our Heavenly Father. And he's the way that we get to eternal life 
with our Heavenly Father. See, God wants to connect with you and I. You shouldn't come to church because it's the thing to do. You should come to church because you want to connect with him a little bit deeper. You want to experience his presence maybe a little bit stronger. That's why you should come to church is to experience him, not just have knowledge about him, but to know him. The agnostics, the only way that they can become spiritually advanced, they said, was through knowledge. And John is saying it's not just knowledge about God. It's knowing him that really matters. Yes, get knowledge, but in your knowledge, get understanding of who he is. See, we can know a lot about God, but not know him personally. We can know all the Bible verses, sing all the songs. We can quote the prayers and wear the cross and even have the tattoo and the bumper sticker. But that doesn't mean that we know him. We know of him, but do you know him? That's what John is saying is so important, is that we should know God, not just know about him. And we do this through a relationship. Second Timothy 3 7 says they are ever learning and never coming to the knowledge of truth. What is truth? Jesus. Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the life, and the truth. Because everybody else's truth, it's it's up to change. What we thought was fact in the history books, now we learn out later, oh, no, that wasn't fact. What we thought was fact in history, we would have, I mean, science, we would have staked our life on it. Nope, all of a sudden, we've discovered some new stuff. Truth is always changing except for in Jesus. That is the truth. So he says, you're ever learning, but you're never coming to the knowledge of the truth. That's why John writes, the light appeared so mankind could walk in this light and be in fellowship with him. See, it's the sweetest invitation I've ever received in my life is to get to experience life with my Savior. The eternal God, he appeared for a relationship. I still can't, no amount of knowledge can explain that to me. That's why you must experience him with your heart, because on paper, we're not good enough. On paper, we don't deserve his goodness, his kindness, his mercy, his forgiveness. But he doesn't just look at what's on paper. He looks at the heart. And so to to get to experience this forgiveness, you have to come to him with your heart, not your mind. Your mind will tell you you're not good enough. Your mind will tell you he's angry at you. Your mind will tell you God doesn't love you. But your heart, if you'll open up your heart to him, you'll hear him whisper to your heart, and he'll tell you, you're the apple of my eye. I want to experience life with you. I've got great plans for you. I want to prosper you, and I want to bless you. I want to be a good father to you. I want a relationship with you. In verse 4, he's talking and he says, we write this letter so that our joy might be complete. So what does he mean by that? It's not the fact that he wrote a letter and then went, woohoo, now I can celebrate, I'm all joyful now, I wrote the letter. No, he's telling people the correct way about this relationship and this Savior so that his joy will be complete when people come to accept this truth and this Savior, then his joy is complete. When you're having a conversation with somebody, doesn't it touch your heart when later they say, that's exactly what I needed? Thank you for that. It makes your joy complete, doesn't it not? It does something on the inside of you. That's why John's saying, he says, I'm writing this message to you to all that's going to read this, because this will make my joy complete, knowing that I can share this truth about the Savior that I not only saw, I not only heard, 
but I touched him. He was real. And my joy will be complete if you'll partake in that relationship as well. See, he wants others to experience this love. In other words, he's saying, this is so good. I want to share it. It's when you find that place that has that perfect meal or that perfect piece of pie. Man, you want to tell somebody about it. Or you read just that perfect book and you're like, oh, man, I can't wait to tell somebody about this. They need to, they need to read this and experience it for themselves. Or if you hear of somebody that's going on vacation to a place that you've been and you tell them the best place ever, like if you're there, don't leave until you see such and such because it's fantastic. You want to share that goodness. That's what Jesus told us to do is to share the good news about him. See, in verse 5, I love it because God's were described as all different things with all different characters, but our Heavenly Father was described as light, and in Him is no darkness. There's no evil in this God that we serve. When we turn the light on, it conquers darkness. When He walks into a room, His presence will conquer the darkness and then when we become Christians, that light becomes inside of us. So much so that the more we walk in that light, we should be able to walk into the dark places and the darkness should scatter. The enemy should tremble. Why? Because we showed up with the light of Christ in us. A light will light your way and let you know which way to go. It's great when you can turn a light on in the room and see the, all the obstacles that you could have fallen over if you were just stumbling around in the dark. A light will show you the truth. And John says, and God, he's pure. And he's holy. Isn't that one that you want to serve? You don't want to serve one that's still broken and all mixed up, right? You want to serve somebody that's got it together that's pure, that's holy. And the light appeared, why? Because we were in darkness. We were living in darkness. So what the light does is it reveals what is hidden in the dark, not to shame you. Because see, when you feel shame, you're ashamed of who you are. Guilt makes you feel ashamed of what you've done. But shame, makes you feel bad about who you are. God never comes to shame you. When he shows the light in areas of your life, it's to reveal to you areas that need to be worked on, not to shame you. See, it's, it's, he says that when his light comes, that he can purify us. And he can forgive us. Jesus says, I see what you've done. I see who you are. Walk with me. Because he knows that his influence, his presence is going to rub off on you. The, more you the, the people that you hang around with, you come more, become more and more like them. So if you want to have a better life, look at who you're hanging around with. And Jesus says, Come and walk with me. Bring me your baggage. I already know what you've got. I already know how broken you are. I already know all the things that you've done. But let's go for a walk. Come and walk with me through this journey. See, his light reveals it so that we can become brighter. His light is like a mirror that teaches us more about ourselves. The more you begin to walk with him, the more he starts to show you, to reveal to you areas that need to be changed. It can even be our mindset, the dark thoughts that we have about ourselves, about others. And his light can help reveal that. Then what we are supposed to do is not hide that sin or hide that fault. Say, God, you know what? You shone a light on that. I see that now. 
I need to change that. I'm going to do something about that. But God, I need your forgiveness. And I need you to help purify me so that I can be more of a reflection of you. I love that the light doesn't just shine around us, but it comes inside of us. You can't get any closer than that. I've heard it say that Christianity is the only religion that grants us absolute assurance of where we stand with God. All other religions say that we're saved by our works. Therefore, they can never be sure that they are secure and making heaven until after they die. Christianity is the only religion that says that we are saved because of what somebody else did for us. How wonderful is that? That means you can't earn it because it was a gift that was given. You just have to receive it. The religious people say, well, but you need to do some good works. And you should. But that doesn't mean you're going to lose your salvation if you don't. It means you'll have different consequences here on earth. And maybe you won't have the rewards that you should have received in heaven. But Jesus died on the cross and he covered it all. That's freedom. That's freedom knowing that when you've accepted him into your life that you have a place that's secure in the family of God. How amazing is that? And then as you walk with him and get to know him, you want to be a good son and daughter. And you want to do good things that will reflect his character and his love. That's why Jesus later said that we're the light of the world. Verse 6 says, if we claim to have fellowship with, with him, and yet we walk in darkness, then we're not living out the truth. We're double-minded. It says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, and we have fellowship with one another, not just him, but with our brothers and sisters, that the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. He wants us to walk in the light. Verse 9 says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us. In light of your loving presence, when God shows me something, I'm saying, you know what? You shined a light on that. And I see that I'm not all that I could be. And I want to be all that you called me to be. Sometimes we can't change things about ourselves until it's revealed. Have you ever had somebody tell you something that you were a certain way and you didn't even note it, notice it at all until somebody said something? Maybe they say stuff like, you know, every time you make a joke, you've hurt somebody's feelings. You're like, I never even thought of it that way. Or maybe they say things like, you know, when you talk to so-and-so, you're always so short, and it sounds very rude. And you're like, really? I didn't even notice that. Well, God will do the same thing with us. He will all of a sudden tweak our conscience. He'll shine a light on a conversation or a situation, and we're like, oh, I didn't even know. So see, he reveals those things to us, not to belittle us, but to help us become the best version of us that we can possibly be. Embrace it when he shows you those things and say, thank you for showing me. Now I know I can, I can do something about it. He wants us then to walk in the light. Because see, in that light, there's freedom. In that light, there is joy, there's love, there's peace, there's help, there's healing, and there's deliverance. When Jesus was talking to his disciples in the crowd, he said that he was the light of the world. And then in the next verse, he says, and you are the light 
of the world, meaning us still today. In other words, he says, don't hide that light. Don't put it under a basket, but let it shine so that everyone in the household can partake of the light. Why? Because he's put a light inside of us. So we are to be a light, and we're meant to give his light to everyone, not just the people we like or get along with. We're to give the light especially to those co-workers that we don't like, the neighbors that upset us so much, even maybe the people in our household. There's a dark area, and he says, I need you to be a light because I was a light for you when you didn't even like yourself. I was a light for you. And he says, I need you to be that light now for others. He said, we do this, we let our lights shine so that they may see our good works, not so they pat us on the back, but so they will glorify your Father in heaven because it all reflects back to him. We want to be good ambassadors of our Heavenly Father. We want to be good representatives. We want to be good sons and daughters and not bring shame to the family of God. But how do we do this? It's not a checklist because you're going to fail. It's not a lecture that you give yourself because after a while you're going to quit listening. It's walking in the light. It's getting to know him. It's being thankful and grateful for every day that he wakes you up. It's being thankful and grateful that when you mess up, you know that he's not going to kick you to the curb, but you can ask for forgiveness. It's looking around at the wonderful things in nature that he has given us and the beauty that he has sculpted and saying, that's my father that did that. It's cherishing the people that he's put in your life that bring you joy and only because your Heavenly Father created them do you have joy in your life when you're with that person. That's how you get to experience him. That's how you start to walk in the light and it starts to change you. You then become a light in a dark place. Live in such a way that God gets the glory for your life. See, we need to be a light in the darkest of places. People might say, why did God put me in this hell hole of a place for a job? Well, because it was a hell hole and you represented a heavenly citizen. And I'm not saying that you have to stay there, but while you are there, shine your light. Show them something different so that they hunger after what you have. We need to be the light in the dark place. We need to be the light with a coworker we don't like, with a cashier that's rude, with a food server that messes up our order. That's how we become Christ-like. And here's the good deal about both of this. It's a win-win. Each time you do that, you kick the enemy in the teeth. You make him back off further from you. You weaken his hold on you and on those that you love when you walk in the light. You being here tonight, you walked in the light. You weakened the enemy's hold, even if you haven't listened to one word I said. The fact that you have sat in church, you weakened the enemy's hold on you. You helped your family and your loved ones by coming to church tonight. Do you know that? Again, even if you didn't listen to one thing I said, you came into church and you sat down and God's presence is here, whether you felt it or not, whether you opened up your heart to it or not. God's presence is here, why? Because you're here. Because if you're a Christian, you carry the Holy Spirit with you. So see, just by you being here tonight, you've weakened the enemy's hold on your heart and on your mind. See, if we want to experience more of heaven on earth, then we shine his light to make the world a better place, and we cast out some of the darkness. 
Why should we shine our light? That's one way that we can tell God, thank you for all that you've done for me. I'm reminded of the story of Peter when he was in the boat and he saw the miracle that took place. And rather than getting really excited and saying, that's really great, I want to I snuggle in closer to this guy. He can do some really cool things. His insides crumbled, and he says, you got to get away from me, because I'm no good. And you, you're holy, but I'm no good. I'm lousy. I don't have anything good in me. I don't want to taint you. I don't want to rub off on you. And Peter became one of the strongest before he died, shouting the praise of his Savior and his Heavenly Father. Why? Because Jesus' is goodness his light cast out the darkness in Peter's soul. Peter was thankful. I can put myself in the same position. I'm sure you could too at parts of your life. Of God, why would you use me? I'm just a mess up. I mess things up all the time. I keep going back and doing things I shouldn't do and saying things I shouldn't say and seeing things I shouldn't see. Why do you even waste your time on me? It's because of his goodness. And we should remember that none of us deserve his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, and then his blessings, his love, his peace. So. How do we say thank you? What could we possibly do? You can't buy him anything. He has everything he needs, and if he doesn't have it, he'll create it. He doesn't need anything except for he wants a relationship. He wants our love. And the way that we can say thank you is to be a light for those others that he loves. He loves the unlovables, and he wants us to be a light for them. That's how we make this world a better place, and that's how we leave the world a better place for those that will carry on after us. I'm thankful because somebody that was walking in the light <clears throat> gave me hope when I was in a dark place. Somebody that was walking in the light told me the good news about this Savior that I was good enough for. Somebody that was walking in the light bowed their knees and said a prayer with me. Somebody that was walking in the light gave me inspiration and gave me security and knowing how deep their relationship was with their Heavenly Father. See, my life song can be summed up in that little Sunday school song that says, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And I kind of want to change that because I don't want it to be a little light. I don't want to just be a candle. I want to be a floodlight that you have to put sunglasses on. It's like, whoa, whoa, could you see that? I can't even look into it. That's what I want to be. I want to be a light for Jesus because he's been such a light for me, especially in the dark, dark time. The closing song that they're going to sing is talking about Jesus walking into the darkness. And the song in the chorus is, and here we are to worship you because of that. If you don't know the Savior or if you've walked away or maybe you knew of him, maybe you said a prayer, but you didn't really ever get to experience him. Why don't you give it another try tonight? Why don't you say, God, I really want to not just know about you. I want to know you. 
I want to experience you because I've got so much darkness. I need, I need some light. I need some joy. And I need some peace. And Jesus says, I want to do life with you. I got some wonderful things to show you. And I want to heal what's broken. And I want to give you hope. That's my Jesus. That's my Savior. And I hope you get to know him too. God bless you.